I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we hear updates from the Ramstein meeting in Brussels, analyse accusations from Moldova that Moscow was plotting to violently overthrow the country's pro-European leadership with the help of saboteurs, and we hear from foreign correspondent Colin Freeman on the Elena Zelenska Foundation and the similarities one Ukrainian soldier found between his experience in the war and the film All Quiet on the Western Front. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 14th of February, day 356. And with me to discuss the latest news from Ukraine and around the world, I'm joined by our Brussels correspondent, Joe Barnes, our assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley, and foreign correspondent, Colin Freeman. I started by asking Joe for the latest updates from Ukraine. I'll start with the situation in Volodar, which is a slightly less spoken about area of the war. It's about 100 miles southwest of Bakhmut in the Donetsk region, which has stolen the, the headlines of late. And sorry, I'm in the NATO headquarters and it's very, very busy given a summit on. I'm just trying to find a quiet corner. So there you go. I found one. So um, in Volodar, we've seen an uptick in Russia's attempts to capture the town. It's described as fairly strategically important. What I would note is it, the Russian attempts to seize Volodar have been described by a kind of Russian military bloggers and domestic, domestic kind of critique of the operation has been shambolic, to say the least. So um, what we noted was there was a high mark, high Mars rocket strike or a Ukrainian multi-launch rocket system that had been donated for, to them by the West. The US have donated HIMARS, and there's the, the UK and German version, the M270, which we don't know which one it is, but the um, commander of the Vostok Battalion, which is the separatist battalion that was fighting in the Donbass in 2014 and has since been brought into the Russian military and conventional forces as part of the war effort in Ukraine. And its commander, Alexander Kodakovsky, he said that his battalion's headquarters outside of outside of Volodar were hit by a high mass rocket and essentially destroyed, killing one senior officer. Let's look at like the longer and wider picture here. Um, so in recent weeks, Volodar has become one of the main focal points of Russia's renewed offensive, as the Kremlin kind of seeks to regain the, initi- the initiative after months of stalemate. And so Ukrainian officials have claimed that Moscow's forces are really sort of bearing down on Volodar, really trying to launch these huge, huge kind of offensive waves on the on the town. So Ukrainian officials have predicted that in recent weeks that Russia is losing up to 100, between 150 and 300 troops a day uh, to the extent. And then a spokesman for a local sort of military defence force, Aletsky uh, Drimitrov, said that he believes that Russia has lost in total 5,000 members of its elite 155th Naval Infantry Grouping, which is a, say it's an elite an elite kind of task force. It was, it was involved in the attempt to seize Kiev, um, Urban Butcher, and so it's been used at every big moment by the Russians in the war. There's a guy called Tom Cooper, he's a military historian, and he did this fantastic kind of long-read blog which I can link to on Twitter later if anyone's interested. And he's highlighted a lot of haphazard tactics where essentially Russia has had to throw kind of vast numbers of men across these large open plains because Volodar sits on top of a, on top of a hill. Uh, so it kind of gives the Ukrainian defensive troops like, oversight of what's going on around them. It gives them a great kind of vision to fire artillery. And he, he noted that on one attempt, it was a, 25th of January, if I remember correctly, there was this attempt by Russia to sort of skirt around one part of the city and and take control, but it essentially meant crossing a area of kind of 500 metres of open ground, which the Ukrainians had fire control on. 
They quickly took up the front of the Russian advance, but also managed to hit the rear of it, cutting the supply, the line of communication, I think uh, Dom and the military expert would call it. And with that, it essentially created a kill zone in the middle that either Russians were killed, captured, or somehow managed to escape with their lives. But that was that was one sort of incident where the Russians suffered. And what we saw, we were sent by the kind of people at Maxar Technologies with some really interesting satellite imagery of Volodar and the surrounding settlements. And like, if you look at the difference between... So there was a place called Petrovica, which is a small settlement close by. And the picture on... And it was taken in August. And then a picture from last week. The town is no longer there. It's been completely raised to the ground. So that's a really sort of kind of heavy fighting there in Volodar, and I kind of recommend people look into it. It's, it's just a, it's one of those kind of less spoken about areas that that we have ignored at some point because of what's going on in back. But I'll stop there if anyone's got any questions. Thanks, Joe, and, and thank you very much for calling in from NATO headquarters. I'm sure we'll we'll get to where you are and what's happening there a little bit later. Francis, can I bring you in now? There's been quite a few developments diplomatically and politically across Europe. Can you talk us through them? Well, thanks, David, and welcome back to our listeners around the world. Yes, I want to start with the broader question of Russian destabilisation efforts and specifically this huge diplomatic row this morning that's erupted with regard to Moldova. So Maya Sandu, Moldova's president, has accused Russia of plotting to violently overthrow the country's pro-European leadership with the help of saboteurs disguised as anti-government protesters. Now, just to contextualise this geographically for our international listeners, Moldova is a country of around 2.6 million people, neighbouring Romania and Ukraine. It received EU candidateship candidateship status in the summer of 2022, but over the past year has faced numerous anti-government protests organised by a fugitive oligarch named Ilan Shaw. Now, Moscow's alleged plot in this instance, is said to have evolved, and I'm reading a direct quote from Sandu here, saboteurs with violent military background, camouflaged in civilian clothes, undertaking actions and attacks on the state institutions and taking hostages. This is under the guise of protests by the so-called oppositions. They seek to overthrow the constitutional order and replace legitimate power with an illegitimate one. Now, I think it's important to say here that, of course, there are political benefits for her in saying this. But I do think that there is more to this, more accuracy to this story than perhaps detractors would say, because we've been following this for some time. President Zelensky has has quite consistently talked about Moldova as being a place or a theatre for Russian activity. Not only that, I remember us talking several months ago about how the this former Soviet Republic has been subjected to continuous Russian pressure ever since the invasion back in February last year because they share a border. Moldova's pro-Western prime minister had to resign due to considerable protest activity. They blame the crisis, that political crisis, on Russian agitation. I remember the Washington Post documented how the Kremlin security forces had channeled advisors and tens of millions of dollars into Moldova to cultivate a group of pro-Russian political leaders, including some sanctioned by the US government. So this is a big story and, and something that no doubt we will want to return to. Just one other diplomatic thing, staying again on Russia, and I'll come back to some other countries later on, but quite interesting that Kyrgyzstan, which was due, is, is now going to be hosting a Russia-led security bloc's peacekeeping drills this year instead of Armenia, which last month declined to host the exercise. So this again speaks to some of the tensions within the former Soviet bloc. The uh, of course, that's something that James Kilner has spoken about on this podcast numerous times. And But we're seeing further evidence of it here. Armenia, Armenia has engaged in a dispute with Azerbaijan over certain regions and said last month that it would be unreasonable for it to host drills of the CSTO, that's the Collective Security Treaty Organization, in the near future due to this, this de- destabilization that's happening in the region. And of course, it doesn't want to be seen as hosting 
the main Russian-led security bloc as a consequence of that. So again, it does speak to, to trouble in that region, which we've touched on. And I also wanted to draw attention again to Belarus, because I spoke yesterday about how the United States have been telling its citizens to leave Russia. Well, we're now hearing that France, the USA and Brazil are telling their citizens to leave Belarus. Clearly, there are quite substantial concerns that Belarus will become an active combatant again in Putin's illegal invasion and fear for citizens who are there in case they are detained, for instance. I noted as well that the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee here in Britain, Alicia Kearns, MP, suggested that it was likely time for the UK embassy in Belarus to do the same as well. So to to also recommend that British citizens leave Belarus. So again, interesting developments in, in that former Soviet country. And lastly, just on the theme of, of, of countries that are working more closely with Russia, and this one, of course, has raised eyebrows and we've talked on in the past, South Africa. So the controversial Russian frigate that we were talking about before has sailed now into Cape Town. It arrived yesterday and is re- refueling after a long voyage from Russia. The this is there, it's of course there to participate in these joint maritime operations with the South African and Chinese navies. Now I understand from reading reports about it this morning that the ship is proudly sporting the large Z on the starboard sign. That's of course the symbol associated with the invasion of Ukraine, and it's caused real anger from the official opposition in the country. The Democratic Alliance defence spokesman has said that this shows that, uh, that Russia is not deserving of the South African neutrality of that it currently has on the issue of Ukraine. The, he said that the ANC government is abandoning its officially declared neutral position on the Russian-Ukraine conflict. Russia's clear objective with these exercises is to abuse South Africa for their propaganda against the West. The South Africa seems to be prepared to play the role of a useful idiot. This is senseless and a very irresponsible act by the ANC government to please their Russian masters at any cost. This silly attitude will alienate us further from our major trading partners and investors and might push us over the edge into grey listing and the loss of major trading concessions into the African Growth and Opportunity Act. So uh, a lot of anger in South Africa from the opposition, but also uh, this is still going ahead. There are still these major exercises that we are expecting to see in the coming days, including involving hypersonic uh, missiles, so we understand. So uh, a lot is happening uh, with regard to Russian allies, and I say that in inverted commas at the moment. And so I wanted to start with them today. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Joe Barnes, anything more from you before we go to Colin Freeman? So, uh, no, I I, I, I could talk you through what's happening at uh, the Ramstein meeting in, Bru- in Brussels at Brussels he- headquarters for NATO. Essentially, what, what Ukraine have come into the room, they've asked for three A's of their allies, air defence, artillery and armour. And essentially, what there is 54 countries involved. So you've got the 30 NATO allies, Finland, Sweden are involved, and then 20 or so others who are unnamed for various reasons, mainly because we believe there are some neutral countries involved uh, that probably don't want the world to know that they are gifting armor and weapon relief or as such to Ukraine. But what's yeah, what's quite interesting is that, um, the Ukrainians have come into the room. They've made acutely aware that the let the world know that they need to hurry up and deliver on their promises. And there has there has been a sort of fighter jet element. There's been lots of that kind of loud noises around whether. Governments around the world will start sending F-16s or maybe some Soviet-era MiGs. But that that has actually died down when it comes to the serious nitty-gritty of what Ukraine's armed forces need to basically repel this kind of latest building Russian offensive in eastern Ukraine. And they basically argued that, look, we need to have more air defence systems because we need more air defence around the front line to stop to stop what they consider and NATO intelligence considers to be a large build-up of Russian aerial assets, both fixed wing and rotary, so helicopters and jets that are building on the borders with Ukraine and in occupied territories. So they've made air defence a, a key demand. And then the other one is artillery. We've covered extensively yesterday the efforts in the West to ramp up production. But what we do know is Ukraine is expending 155 millimeter artillery shells faster than they can be resupplied by the West. So they are 
fire about 6,000 rounds a day when the when European arms manufacturers only make 20,000 shells a month. So they're in, they're in kind of a situation where I think that it looks like some Western defence ministers inside the room have kind of cautioned Ukraine, saying, look, you cannot keep firing at this rate, but we will do our best to support you. And that means engaging with industry and asking... Um, asking industrial the military industrial complex to ramp up production what was quite interesting boris pistorius the german defense minister he said that germany is going to start re start rebuilding start manufacturing ammunition for the shepard anti-aircraft tank that has been donated to ukraine previously one of the main sources of um believe stockpiles for ammunition for this system was switzerland but switzerland have constantly said no we're not sending ammunition to ukraine because we're a neutral country so that's that's interesting that germany have really taken the first step to say okay we're going to start manufacturing this this system this system again and this ammunition again because ukraine needs it so there's lots of questions like that to be answered before sort of fighter jets come along and i'll stop there well, thank you very much, Joe. And do let us know later before before we leave you what's on your agenda and how you'll be covering this meeting. Colin Freeman, can I come to you? You've written several really interesting articles for The Telegraph. I'd recommend everybody does read them. Can we talk about your interview with Nina Horbachova first? Nina's the director of the Lena Zelenska Foundation. And I mean, it's, it's, it's an absolutely awful read, really, but amazing what her and her organisation are doing. Can you talk us through what she said to you? Yes, so um, just to remind me, there's Elena Zelenska Foundation. That is the foundation of the First Lady, who, along with her husband, is much in demand on the diplomatic circuit these days, travelling the world, raising awareness of Ukraine's plight. And the foundation, I think, is essentially a a charity that has been set up to to channel some of the, the generous donations of help that have come from the great and the good that she has met during her travels around the world. It, it does many things, that are pretty uh, bog standard charity things, rebuilding hospitals, providing relief to people in areas hit by the conflict, that sort of thing. But um, the thing that we were talking to uh, um, Ms. Horbachova, the, the, the director of the charity, about was um, a specific issue, and this was attempts to reform the country's orphanage system. Now, um, Ukraine has about 100,000 children in orphanages. Obviously, there are orphanages all over the world, but there's a particularly high number of them in Ukraine. It's, I think, per capita about the highest institutional, the, the highest rate of children in institutional care in Europe. It's um, something of a legacy from the Soviet Union period. The war has obviously thrown the issue of these orphanages into sharp relief as uh, many of the children have had to be evacuated at very short notice when the invasion started. Some have been returned simply to whichever, you know, even if they don't have parents, they may have distant family members who have just had to take care of them uh, in the short term. Others have been uh, moved into other emergency care, which, of course, is is very difficult in wartime conditions, taken across as refugees into (coughs) into Poland and and beyond. And then others, we understand, may have ended up actually being taken to Russia if they were in orphanages that suddenly found themselves um, in areas under Russian occupation when the war first started. So there's a whole host of problems to deal with there. But as the foundation has pointed out, it's it's also sort of shone a spotlight on the the, the existing difficulties within the orphanage system, where there have been a a lot of problems highlighted about just the the generally poor conditions that the, the children who live in them suffer. There was a BBC documentary just earlier this year, an investigation which showed that there was problems with abuse, neglect, chronic underfunding, And also some quite horrific scenes of orphanages where children had languished in them really until they were adults living in cot, you know, lying in cots. A lot of them are disabled where they had uh, spent so much time that their limbs, you know, had had had, had become crooked or whatever because um, they they simply weren't suited for those size of beds anymore. All kinds of dreadful things. Some of our listeners may be reminded of the kind of reports that we heard about orphanages in Romania back in the um, early 1990s. This has a lot of sort of bears a lot of similarities. Um, 
The reason why it's such a particular problem, we understand, is that back in the Soviet period, there were, the state generally had very few compunctions about taking children into care. It was a lot easier than it is in, in the UK, for example. And so that they didn't just take in orphans in, in the classic sense of somebody who's um, lost both their parents, but they take in children of parents with drug and alcohol problems, and even sometimes children of parents who were going abroad to work. Uh, and so it, it's, it's, it's quite a substantial issue. And the, the plan is by the, 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 the First Lady's Foundation, apart from highlighting this in, in general sense, is to try and get more children into foster care instead. I think there's already about 10,000 children in foster care in Ukraine. It's not an t- entirely new concept, but um, the hope is to encourage a culture of foster care uh, much more, encourage parents to, to think about perhaps adopting foster children if they can. And of course, with the war, unfortunately, there are at least, I think, certainly a couple of hundred children, if not more, who have lost both parents during the war and who will be needing, ideally, Ukrainian families to look after them. So that, that's the, that, that is the broad issue that we were reporting on. Can I ask, you write that since the war started, an estimated 14,000 Ukrainian children, including non-orphans, have been forcibly removed to Russia. What did Nina Horbacheva tell you about about them? Do we know how they were taken? And do we know in the end what happened to them? Uh, Yes, this is a sort of part two of this issue, really, which is that um, during the war in in the areas where that came under Russian occupation, a lot of children are understood to have been forcibly taken, deported over into Russia, not just children, adults as well. The statistics that you hear vary, but it's between up to possibly 40,000 people in all, of which about 14,000 possibly are children. Now, some of these are people who've gone presumably with their parents. Others apparently are children who were possibly in orphanages or who were just discovered on the streets, perhaps separated from their parents during the fog of war and who have been taken over into Russia, where the, 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 this, this is ostensibly an act of mercy, but the Ukrainians say this is an attempt really to, to brainwash these kids and to rob them of their Ukrainian identity and make them grow up as staunch young Russians instead. And interestingly, the scheme has been cheer-led by Russia's own children's commissioner, who is a mother of five herself. She has adopted five other kids, including a, a Ukrainian teenager, and she she appears on um, social media quite a bit, sort of presenting herself very much as a kind of caring Mother Russia figure. But on some of the social media output, you also see mentions of young Ukrainian kids being educated in the values of Mother Russia. And generally, I, th- I think in, in in common parlance, brainwashed would be the way many people would would put it and generally told that mother russia is is the place to be in and um don't worry about that place ukraine that you thought you grew up in and of course the the first lady's charity is extremely concerned about this they really just say that this is that this is not adoption some russian families are being encouraged to adopt these children they're paid a thousand i think a thousand dollars a year or something if they will adopt a ukrainian child which um clearly raises its own issues. Anyone who's involved in child protection will tell you that incentivizing, giving parents financial incentives is, is not, should not be the, the sole reason to encourage children, to encourage families to, to go down the adoption route. So yeah, the, the, the charity really sort of says this, this, is, this is kidnapping by another name and really should not be happening. Thanks, Colin. Just very, very quickly, Joe. I mean, Colin, what you've just said is, I mean, it, it sort of boils the blood really doesn't it i mean you know i know that the our ukrainian listeners i can't imagine well there's many many things of course in this in this awful war that'll make them absolutely furious but everything you've just said is is well it's just completely fury inducing isn't it to hear about children being being kidnapped and brainwashed in, in, into a country which has invaded you did you get a sense of the anger and the sadness from from nina when you spoke to her to be honest she's she's pretty she's a fairly measured character the interview was done through translation as well, so some of the feel of these things is, is some, the emotion is sometimes lost. She's very much focused purely on the adoption issue, really about encouraging families in Ukraine to adopt. But during the piece, we wanted to address some of the the, the, the wider 
context of it, obviously, which is which is where these this issue of children getting taken off um, into into Russia comes in. I, I should point out we don't really know how many of these kids are um, are we you know were taken from orphanages. I do remember um, uh, my Telegraph colleague Roland Oliphant at one point. Um, stumbling across a, 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 an orphanage full of children somewhere in the in the Donbass region or eastern Russia in the early days of the war and being asked to help evacuate them. So I, I think where it was possible, most of the the orphan kids um, did, uh, you know, w- were removed from the trouble. Um, but it certainly seems that some of them may have slipped through the net. Well, thank you very much, Colin. I, I hadn't heard that from, from Roland, so maybe it'd be good when he, when he gets back to talk to him about it. Francis, did you have something to add as well? Thanks, David. Yeah, I'm so interested in hearing Colin's reflections on the interview, and I would recommend that listeners do do read it. Um, my, my, I suppose my, my first comment is uh, there is going to be this big summit on uh, in Switzerland, in Geneva, on Thursday, looking at this issue of children. And I think that there'll be some very interesting things that are coming out of that. And I think it's very welcome that there are more high-profile conversations happening on this issue because, of course, regular listeners will know that when we were first talking about it many months ago, it wasn't really being talked about readily. There were a few reports scattered around and then there were lots of sort of rumours that one could read online, but there was not the the, the level of scrutiny and analysis on this subject. But I I suppose it's also just worth talking as well about the general impact of children. Um, As um, Gabriella was talking about last week, that we know of millions of children who have, of course, um, suffered or are vulnerable as a consequence of the war not you know leaving time with their parents the sort of ptsd and the consequences of of being in a war zone the impact on one's education all of these issues really matter i i suppose i wonder colin whether there were any broader reflections on this question about what can be done to tackle the issue of children more generally i think certainly if, if you go to places like lviv in western ukraine which has become the sort of unofficial hub for international aid agencies and ngos there there is a flood of people coming in who can provide help on on those fronts psychosocial help uh help specifically for kids of all sorts, indeed, that the, the the amount of available expertise is is often almost more than is, is is sometimes the country has capacity to absorb. That's certainly my experience from covering other sort of conflict zones and war zones of this sort. I mean, generally, when when I've been travelling around Ukraine, you 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 do sometimes notice how children often seem remarkably resilient in these situations that perhaps they're not always fully appreciative of the uh, of of the sort of the, the dreadful sense of jeopardy that hits you as an adult within these um within these situations that that's sort of natural children's carefreeness you know you see them sometimes manning their own little check play checkpoints um carrying makeshift guns and i once remember seeing a, a kid with a with an m law you know an anti-tank missile uh, casing that um, uh, his dad had fired at somebody months before, and he w- he had now been given it. It was his sort of favourite um, favourite toy um, that he was using to man a, a checkpoint. Um, but you do also hear people talking uh, about how their own kids have been affected by it. It's not something people open up about very very quickly, but you hear them say like, "Our kids have grown up." Um, they they don't do childish things anymore. They're much more attuned to sort of servicing the family needs in, uh, and, and generally just become adults before their time. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, uh, Francis, for that. Colin, uh, there's one more thing I want to talk to you about, which I, I thought was an absolutely fascinating piece you've written for The Telegraph uh, about how All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, the war epic from Netflix that was released recently, has hit a, hit a bit of a nerve in the trenches of Ukraine. It's kind of a surprising story, but can you talk us through what you found? Thanks. Yes, so for, for anyone who's not seen it or read about it, All Quiet on the Western Front is a remake of remake of two remakes actually which are uh, of a film based on a novel by a, a german soldier talking about what trench warfare was like in world war one the film is up for i think 14 baftas and nine oscars in the awards season next month 
And as you can imagine, about any it, it, with, as with any f- f- film involving World War One, it, it shows pretty unflinching scenes of combat in the trenches, artillery shells going over, troops having involved in hand-to-hand fighting, and ju- just the, the general horror of young men, and it is mainly young men as opposed to young women who are playing a part in the Ukraine war, young men being told suddenly that they've got to risk their lives for their country. And of course, the parallels with Ukraine, where you have a a generation of young men now who have gone through that experience and who are often fighting in trench warfare style conditions, that, that the parallels are pretty obvious. So what what we did for this piece, I interviewed the director and the two scriptwriters who are two um, aspiring British scriptwriters who have been trying to get this remake done, their, their, their remade script done for 16 years, I think, and finally had a breakthrough in very big time. But in order to sort of make it a bit different from some of the other coverage of the film, we decided to interview a few Ukrainian soldiers, including one I know. I'm not going to uh, say his name, Yevgeny. It's not his real name. But just to ask him what he whether he'd seen it or not. And um, I was half expecting to say, no, I'm sorry, but I don't know what you're talking about. But he said, oh, yes, um, I saw that. I downloaded it on Netflix when it came out late last year. And j- just, again, for the benefit of readers who may be thinking, how on earth has he got Netflix? Ukraine has a very, very good internet service. And generally speaking, the mobile phone coverage or Wi-Fi coverage is better than it is in this country. <coughs> so he had watched it while he was in his base one day and it, he said it reminded him exactly of what the conditions were like in in ukraine he said it was an, a superb telling um of 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 the condition of being in trench warfare um but what one of the some of the comments he made also just brought it home quite a bit. He said in particular that he'd been serving in a unit down in Kherson until late last year when Kherson was liberated. He'd seen his commander killed by a landmine. He'd seen uh, a number of his other uh, other comrades suffering quite badly, just with combat stress and so on. But then, as of Christmas time, he had been diverted to a, a different job in Kiev while his colleagues had been sent over to Bakhmut to the fighting there and I said what was that like and he said well Bakhmut makes Kherson look like a luxury holiday resort in comparison he said of the 60 men that had signed his battalion flag souvenir battalion flag when they had parted company back at Christmas time 30 were now dead which I think uh, you know every now and again you hear somebody you know, giving a fairly unvarnished account like that, which which brings it home a bit, just the, the extent of the, the 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 slaughter that is going on here and the damage it is doing to that young generation of Ukrainians. He also he, he said he he'd stopped re- watching his Facebook page because it said his his Facebook page is just like a rolling obituary now. Um, and he also said that a, a lot of men he knows, not necessarily close companions, are suffering severe mental health problems. They're in institutions that can barely walk. Um, it, it, the, the comparisons with World War One are pretty much entirely apt, if what he said was anything to go by. Joe, can you just give us a sense of what you, the next uh, 24 hours, 48 hours for you looks like covering this NATO meeting? Who will you be speaking to and what are you hoping to get out of it? Yeah, um, just, well, just a comment on, on Colin's telling of the horrors of war. When I was in Ukraine last year, I made an effort to kind of speak to doctors and work about how the health system was working. One thing that we did kind of speak about was soldiers' mental health, and that's always been kind of, I guess, Ukraine is a kind of stiff upper lip country and largely ignored, but they, they said they were having to bring expertise in from overseas in terms of psychologists, and, and they kind of cutely were aware of the problems that kind of British, American and sold other soldiers that had served in Afghanistan and Iraq had come back with, with PTSD. And they said that is something they're really going to have to work on upping their game on in the next few years to ensure that their kind of their soldiers are getting the best treatment. OK, but yeah, back to NATO, back to NATO headquarters here in Brussels. We are um, so this morning and kind of into the early afternoon. I think it wraps up in about 15 minutes. So it's actually three o'clock local time. Has been the meeting of the Ramstein format. It's the US-led Ukraine contact group. And that is essentially the NATO 30, plus about 20 or so others. So it's 54 in total today. 
who are all donating lethal aid to Ukraine, and it's how they coordinate their efforts of getting that aid into the country. Um, so one of them across recently is just the vast amount of is being donated to Ukraine, and they are essentially struggling just to get this into into the country. They've, they've, there's currently it's a obviously it's sensitive but not kind of confidential. There are free routes into Ukraine via Slovakia, via Poland, and via Romania, and they are having to work out how German Marders, American Bradleys, um, UK kind of Brimstone missiles have all been announced and being sent into the country are going to get in into the country in a timely effort, um, a timely fashion ahead of this expected Russian offensive, uh, which we've seen the start of and we've kind of charted over the last few episodes of Ukraine the latest. Um, so in shortly we're going to have a um, a press conference with Lloyd Austin, the American Secretary of State Secretary of State for Defence, I believe Secretary of Defence, and he's and General Milley, who is uh, the chairman essentially of this Ramstein format, and they're going to kind of tell us what has happened. But what we know from kind of briefings, I've been speaking to kind of officials who are involved in the talks, is that Ukraine came in, and as I mentioned earlier, they asked for the three A's: artillery, armor, and air defence. So there's kind of not been this grand talk on fighter jets, but what there has been is uh, the Germans hosted a lunch called, and it was uh, aptly named a Panzer lunch, where they were speaking to allies about their promise to deliver Leopard 2 tanks. Germany has become a bit frustrated with the fact that it was pressured by its allies to donate Leopard 2 tanks, but also to sign the export licenses needed for other allies to send Leopard 2 tanks into Ukraine. Um, but what the Germans feel is that the actions haven't been, haven't kind of followed on from the, the kind of the rhetoric and the talk um, and the pressure that was exerted on Berlin to, to kind of make this happen. So they're, they're trying to, um, the Germans are trying to build an international coalition uh, to form two tank battalions. They reckon that about 64 tanks, I think, off the top of my head would be in these, would make up these battalions and all the necessary kind of mechanics and infrastructure behind having to run these um and they they don't believe that the the likes of the portuguese and the dutch or whoever who have kind of vaguely promised leopard tanks to ukraine through some format or another have kind of come good on their promises the germans uh use the lunch meeting to basically put some pressure on and say you need to um you need to start working a bit harder to make your leopard 2 promises a reality which is quite a, it's quite a stark uh kind of U-turn on the German position from once where they were being completely pressured. The world of sort of piling on, piling on the pressure on, there was a pile on Berlin to get this done. And now it's Berlin putting a concerted effort to try and make this happen. And funny enough, that wasn't briefed to me by a German. It was briefed by a, a an American. So that's, a, that's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, outlook on that. Um, and then later on in the day, you will have NATO ministers defense ministers will meet and that is uh they will meet on ukraine but obviously members of the alliance have been keen not to um seem like it is nato that is donating leaf aid be seen to be escalatory in the face of russia's war in ukraine and on ukraine it doesn't want to kind of drag nato into that even though it is nato allies doing all of the heavy lifting or heavy lifting um, and they they will speak about NATO self defence. They're 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 kind of they're worried about how donate Ukraine have dwindled kind of domestic supplies within the alliance, which means NATO is technically not as capable of defending itself as it was before February the twenty fourth. Um, they are going to discuss funding for NATO. There was always this famous and it was kind of made famous by Donald Trump, who came to NATO headquarters. In, I believe it was June 2018. It still moved to Brussels, actually. Um, and he banged his fists on the table and said, look, Europe doesn't spend as much on defence as America and kind of got them to commit to this promise of all spending 2% of GDP on defence, which was actually originally uh, a commitment made in 2014 when NATO leaders met in Wales. That is due for renewal in 2020. 
four, so the early talks are starting. Um, you'd often you'd often hear that the two percent is described as a floor, not a ceiling. So some countries will look to spend above the two percent, and they will put pressure on other governments to do so. I think Brits are going to do that, um, even though we've seen nothing from the Treasury that indicate they're going to increase defence spending. Um, the Americans, and, and then you look at the Baltics and the Poles; they're also spending a large sum of money on defence and support for Ukraine, again, which kind of exceeds the 2% in GDP. Um, and then the other thing is, um, in Madrid last year, uh, Jens Stoltenberg announced his plan to have kind of hundreds of thousands of troops within NATO on high alert. Um, there's still that talks on how that is made possible are still going on in terms of NATO's new force model. And that they are going to try and defence ministers are going to try and plot how that can be made. That promise can be made into reality ahead of a summit in Vilnius in uh, in July, I believe, if I, off the top of my head, when heads of state, of government, and kind of so prime ministers and presidents of NATO countries all come together for another meeting. So that's kind of a summary of what's going on here in Brussels. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Joe, and uh, best of luck with the reporting over the next over the next day. Um, Francis Sternley, I know you have a couple of quick updates for us, and then I'd like to get all of your final thoughts. Thanks, David. Yes, I just wanted to comment quickly on Ramstein's day and a few things that, that Joe was just talking about there. I was very struck, actually, by the consistency in the line coming out of NATO and the United States on this idea of needing to continue the support for Ukraine for as long as it takes. Both of those um, uh, par- partners, whether it be Lloyd Austin or Jens Stoltenberg, have underlined that. And of course, they've, I'm assuming, agreed that in advance uh, in, in order to make it very clear about the importance of that. Joe also spoke earlier on about this question of fighter jets. And I think it has been noteworthy in the past week or so of seeing the shift that's occurred It's moved away from conversations about having the most high level jets to now being conversations around those sort of older jets, sort of Soviet era or just slightly later than that, that are essentially gathering dust across Europe and sending those to the Ukrainians instead because they may be easier to fly, but also they're, of course, um, less expensive. And it means that the most high tech F-16s and more up to date fighter jets that that would be needed if there were to be, um, you know, a broader escalation of this war wouldn't go to Ukraine. So I just wanted to comment on that. And I think we'll be publishing a piece in our paper by the head of the Defence Select Committee here in Britain. And I know Hamish de Bretton Gordon has got views on this as well, who obviously speaks regularly on the podcast about this this theme and what more perhaps countries can be doing in terms of thinking about fighter jets and moving the conversation along from just merely talking about sending the most up-to-date ones, which of course, as we've spoken about in the past, can take up to 12 months to train uh, pilots to use. Just one other question, uh, one other point on uh, the weapons situation. I noted that Norway will send eight German-made Leopard 2 tanks and other equipment to Ukraine. So just I mention it because it's another uh, number, some sizable number of tanks. I think Norway have around 36 of them in total. So it's you know a sizable chunk of, of those that they have going to Ukraine. And so that tally is continuing to grow. And uh, obviously when they will arrive, we're expecting to see the impact of that. I know that some people have been saying, well, well aren't the Leopard 2s meant to be this game changer? Why aren't we seeing that? Well, it's taking time to get there, first of all, but also I think it'll be depending on how the Ukrainians use them. Will they be using them for offensive operations or will they be using them for defensive operations? And so it's it's perhaps too early to say exactly the manner in which they're going to be used. So we can't judge the importance of the Leopard 2s as yet, but I'm sure that we will in due course. And just one other subject I wanted to touch on, which is the continuing issue of the Black Sea Grain deal, which of course I used to speak about much more often, but it's sort of gone quiet in recent in recent weeks. But I, I come to it again because they, we're hearing this morning that there's quite a sh- big issues that shipping and com- coastal communities around the seaport hub of Odessa are receiving numerous warnings from military officials over the risk of naval mines drifting along the coast and washing ashore. And you can imagine the the 
the anxieties there are around that. Certain spokesmen of the Odessa military administration has said there's now a high probability of naval mines breaking off their anchors and washing up on the shore. But the bigger issue around this is the concerns that it will mean for the Black Sea grain deal and whether it can con- con- continuing to be using and working at the operational level that it currently is if there are the dangers of these mines. And I should say that the Russians have been accused of laying these anti-ship mines, though, of course, I imagine they would say that it is the Ukrainians. We can't, of course, independently verify that. But just one p- last point on this issue of the Black Sea grain deal. I noted that Russia have said that they think it would be inappropriate to extend that grain deal unless sanctions affecting its agricultural exports are lifted and other issues are resolved. Now, if listeners will think back all the way to July, when this safe corridor to allow grain to be exported from Ukraine to Africa and, and to Europe and to elsewhere, when that was brokered by the United, Station, United Nations and Turkey, We said at the time that whilst perhaps it was essential in order to stop famine in Africa and to save tens of thousands of of lives, that there would be political consequences of this, that it would give Russia leverage in diplomatic conversations. And indeed, we're seeing evidence of that here. That's exactly what is happening, that Russia are essentially saying, well, if you want this to continue, you're going to have to give us something. And so, as as I say, I'm not saying that it shouldn't have happened, the grain deal. It's far beyond uh, uh, my my, um, uh, pay grade, as it were, to, to... to reach judgment on that, but it did have consequences. It has kept Russia at the diplomatic table on this issue. And so now we are seeing how that is being leveraged, as I say, in a way that, that may um, aid Russia in terms of the sanctions that have been imposed on it by, by other Western countries. So two uh, just interesting observations I wanted to end on hopefully today. Thank you very much, Francis. We're running out of time and we do have, an, we do have another interview to include at the end of this uh, uh, podcast for this evening. So can I ask all of you just for very quickly for your very final thoughts? Um, Francis or Joe, do you want to go first? The one thing I would say is we have to carry on looking very closely at the not just the big ticket items going into Ukraine, but the, the smaller sort of items um, mainly the 155 millimeter artillery because i think the the fact that uh, the us the, the uk nato are all kind of raising this issue a lot of eu countries are raising this issue um the fact that supplies are dwindling does nato have enough to defend itself in case there is some sort of war it obviously looks as unlikely as as it is at the moment because of what's going on in ukraine and russia but you never know um and just the fact that how Ukraine still needs this this stuff. It's still it's still really reliant on receiving what has been a basic kind of technology that has been sent to sent to it from the very from the very beginning. So I'd I'd keep an eye on whether NATO, the European Union, and other kind of international organisations can actually convince uh, their domestic arms manufacturers to actually ramp up production and start producing these on almost as a war footing. Could could they like the Russians? start running on three shifts a day, working weekends, rather than kind of sitting back and just manufacturing artillery shells and other ammunition as if it, as if it was a planet completely on peacetime. Thank you very much, Joe. Francis Turnley. Thanks, David. Well, I've spoken about Russian disinformation and destabilisation efforts today on a grand geopolitical scale, but I wanted to end with a reflection on the more modest and subtle ways in which these activities can influence the tone of the conversation. It's been noteworthy in recent weeks, the number of messages I've received from people saying that they're concerned that the world is losing interest in the war, often followed by sharing some kind of inaccurate story, most likely deliberate disinformation of some kind, that they've read about online, but they haven't seen reported anywhere. And it seems to me that disinformation is filling the inevitable information vacuum that's been left by news outlets not covering the war as in depth as they were when it began. So I think it just underlines the importance of remaining vigilant regarding source material at the moment as the absence of reporting can and is being exploited. And I wanted just to to reassure listeners that our listenership figures have not waned at any stage. There is more interest now than ever. And last month was our most listened to month that we've had since the war began. And so every act of of listening, in a sense, matters. We spoke last week about how Dom has joined Joe in being sanctioned. And all of us have been uh, approached by phishing attempts online. Bots quite often flood the YouTube versions of our of our episodes. And I see that really as a a measure of success rather than a concern. But I think it does speak to the subtle ways in which this activity is conducted. So do remain vigilant, but, but don't lose heart.
And to finish, uh, Colin Freeman. Yeah, just um, to add a little more on the comments I was passing on from the Ukrainian soldier who had watched all quiet on the Western Front. I mentioned that he said he'd lost um, half of his comrades, perhaps 30 out of 60 men in the battles up in Bakhmut, which clearly doesn't paint a great picture of how things are going there. He, I should just add that uh, he said things seem to be even worse for the Russians. He talked about so-called zombie waves, which basically just blind charges being carried out by the Russians. Again, very much similar to what you see in all quiet on the Western Front, actually. Blind charges where the Russians' troops would apparently just run pell-mell at the Ukrainian lines and were getting cut down in great numbers, leaving the um, the fields littered with bodies. I said, I asked him, does the Ukrainian army expect its soldiers to do that? He said, no, we don't have the manpower and also we wouldn't want to do it anyway. And just generally also on morale, you might think that what I was saying earlier you know, would, would mean that the morale was plummeting at their end. I obviously can't speak for anybody other than the one soldier that I spoke to, but uh, he did say when I've spoken to him in the past that morale is actually good despite the heavy toll. He said um, that everybody keeps smiling. And I remember the quote he used. He said, these are the kind of smiles that bring down empires. Yesterday, we spoke to Professor David Marples from the University of Alberta about the history and politics of Belarus. David took us through the 20th and 21st century and brought us up to the moment of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Here's part two of my interview. You've taken us quite neatly, I think, to talking about the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, what was what had been the... I guess there's two questions here. One is, what has the involvement of Belarus been? And what's been the impact of the full-scale invasion on Belarus as a whole? Well, Belarus has been a factor in that the invasion was launched from Belarus using Belarusian um, area to send miss, launch missiles into Ukraine. Uh, it began with a training exercise between the Russian and Belarusian armies, uh, Operation Fortitude, which ended up being right next to the border of Ukraine in the end. If Russian soldiers were injured, they would come to Belarusian hospitals for recuperation. And even though the groups that took part in the first stage of the war didn't include any Belarusian soldiers and, and actually left Belarusian territory, they've now returned, or at least other forms of Russian military have returned. And over 12,000 Russian troops are currently in Belarus. There may be more than that, maybe up to 20,000. So it's created a lot of pressure on Belarus. It's created a lot of pressure on Belarusian opposition, especially those living outside the country who are now treated as part of the Russian military regime, even though many of them are outside because they oppose it. There is opposition within the country. There's also a Belarusian military regiment fighting on the Ukrainian side, the Kalinovsky regiment, which has several different detachments, but they're fighting as a Ukrainian unit or part of the Ukrainian army, but they are using state symbols and you also see members of the former foreign service members of the security service now form their own organization outside the country and also social networks as well that are continuing outside the country so it's divided belarusians very much and i think belarusians now there's a hardcore maybe 20% that have either sort of stayed with Lukashenko but, or have decided that Belarus can't survive without Russia's support. And they're getting bombarded every day with, with propaganda on their TV and on Russian television, which of course broadcasts into Belarus as well. So they're only getting one line of events, which is why you, some Belarusians have taken this hard line in favor of, of the Russian war in Ukraine and firmly believe that neo-Nazis have taken power in Kiev and have to be removed. So it's a divided society and it's hard to know exactly now what people are thinking because how do you conduct a fair poll? But we do have internet polls and they suggest very strong opposition to Belarus joining in the war to send in Belarusian troops 
about 85-90% are opposed to doing that. And clearly there's a lot of pressure on Lukashenko to join in. Because it looks really, really obvious now when you've got you know, Kadyrov's Chechens, which are no technically a part of Russia, but you've also got Syrians there, you've got Iranian drones there. Putin will basically take any troops that he can. And there are the Belarusians not joining in. They're, they might join in an exercise at home, but they won't go over the border. So I think there's a lot of pressure now. But if he, if this does happen, then I think there's a lot of problems for Lukashenko because the Belarusian army is not a massive army. It's probably got 8,000 crack troops and the rest are just raw recruits, like most of the Russians. The Ukrainians will take care of them fairly quickly, I think, and it will be extremely unpopular among their families. And also there may be a possibility of Belarusians coming into Ukraine for the official army meeting up with the, let's say, Kalinovsky soldiers who've been at the front line pretty well all the time and persuading them to come over to their side. And Lukashenko himself has much less power than he had prior to 2020. He's not a free agent. Moscow is basically the only place he can go and it's the only place he can go and really get anything. And I think increasingly you find China and other countries now slowly beginning to move away from the idea that they want a long war and they're willing to support this war as long as it takes. You don't see that so much in discussions these days. You said just then that Lukashenko is not a free agent. I think a, a lot of the time in the West, well, in the, the way he's seen and understood by Western people is, is as a puppet of, of Putin. So my question really is, to what extent is that true now after the, the full-scale invasion? And picking up on what you just said, can we, can we talk about him still being in charge of Belarus or not? He's a figurehead, but at the same time, he's not, he's not a puppet yet. He's got certain powers. He's amended the constitution. He's introduced a people's assembly, which is basically his own people around now, which has superseded the parliament. And he's changed its nuclear, non-nuclear status. So that in theory now, it would be possible to install a nuclear weapon on Belarusian territory. I remember Belarus gave up its nuclear weapons back in 94, but now in theory it could have another one. Russia could bring in a nuclear weapon into Belarus. And that makes Lukashenko potentially dangerous if he has any control over that. I don't think in the long term he has much of a future because I think he will have to join one side or another. He cannot stay, he cannot stay out of the war for long, much longer. The economy is not doing too well because they cannot export the main assets such as potash, other goods that would normally go through Lithuania to Western states. That's all been stopped now. So it has to rely on Russia as the main trading partner. Sometimes the only trading partner is maybe China to some extent. So he's weak in a number of areas. The question is who would take over and how would he be removed? He's 69 this year, he's not in great health. I mean, if you see him get off an airplane, he takes ages to get down the steps. It's a question how long he would last anyway. So I think Belarusians now have to think about what comes after Lukashenko and whether it will be a member of his security council, for example, or someone from the opposition, someone from the outside of government, if there were a free election. And then the bigger question is, if Belarus went in that direction, how far would Russia stand aside and let them do that? Because it's not Ukraine. You've only got 9.4 million people. And it cannot really stand up to any kind of pressure from, from Russia. It makes it extremely difficult. And it also means that only a total defeat for Russia in Ukraine would be a guarantee of Belarus being able to be independent in its own right and to elect a, a president based on free elections. That's why I think it's, it is difficult. Can I just go back, before my final question, can I just go back quickly to what you said, that Lukashenko ev eventually will have to choose a side? And I just thought about that, and well, from a Ukrainian perspective, the fact that missiles are coming from Belarus, the fact that the, the invasion, as you said, was launched from there, that Russian troops trained there, it would feel to them that they very much have, have chosen a side. It's just he's 
resisting, as you said, the sort of te- the, 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 he's resisting um, going 100 percent. Is is that fair? I mean, is that kind of how the Belarusian he would see it that he hasn't chosen a side, but actually he's doing everything everything apart from the one big thing that Putin wants him to do. Yes, and 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 added to that, one thing to add to that is that Ukraine has actually kept his ambassador in Belarus in Minsk, and it deals with the official Belarusian government. Zelensky doesn't deal with Stikhanovsky. And that, I think, is an extremely significant fact. And Sikhanovskaya is not, she's a unified leader, and I would say she's the recognized leader. But to date, there are other forces operating, such as Kalinovsky regiment, cyber partisans, who are not part of the unified government and operate separately from it. So you could say that the Belarusian opposition is not yet unified enough to be in a position where all people who might go to the opposition are willing to do that. And the regiment attitude is sort of, well, you know, this group is being fated in European capitals and we are right at the front fighting the the Russian army. You know, we're the ones who who were dying in the field. Why should we cooperate with them? But, But ultimately, I think they should do, they have to, but also Zelensky has to make that big move and decide that Lukashenko is not his future. He hasn't done that yet. And he's done a lot of other things for which he's he's quite rightly admired, but at the same time, he has dealt with official Belarus only. Probably because he wants to keep their troops out of the war, but in fact, what use is that if Russia is using that territory as a, as a jumping off point for another invasion of Belarus in the spring, which looks quite likely. So, yeah, I would I would agree that it, he's, not, he's not quite gone yet and he's not quite a total puppet yet either, and unfortunately, in my view. From everything you've said, and, and again, you've sort of mentioned a few things here, so it'd be good maybe to summarise it, but what do you think a likely short-term future, medium-term future looks like for, for Belarus? Well, it would depend on the course of the war, and I think it looks likely that the war will not end quickly, because no matter what the forces coming into Ukraine and the success on the battlefield, how do you ensure the complete defeat of Russian forces? I mean, they haven't even adopted a war footing in in Russia yet. And in theory, if Russia declares officially war on Ukraine, you could get another 100,000 troops, you could get another, I don't know how many thousand tanks in there, it could be completely different, it could be much, much escalated. So that's why I think that we, the West might be able to save Ukraine from obliteration, but it won't knock Russia out of the war if it doesn't want to go out of the war and if it's prepared to expend innumerable casualties, which it seems like it is. You may get, for example, private military corporations taking over the war effort completely, in which case I think Putin's future is limited. So this is really why it's hard to predict the future of Belarus. But 2020 actually did change the mindset of Belarusians. They began to see the world quite differently from earlier. And, this, and the possibility of change and the possibility of a different style of government, many of them are so tired of Lukashenko. I mean, just bored and tired with him. I mean, he's sort of a man from the past. They've grown up with him. Never seen anything different on their TV screens but Lukashenko's whining voice. Um, they badly would like to change that. But the question is how to do it and when can it be done? I don't think he'll last much longer, but he's already lasted longer than most people predicted in 2020. So he is a very skillful political maneuver. He has to be to stay in power for that length of time. He's a brute, he's a tyrant who's killed many people, including his own people. But at the same time, he does have this political acumen to manage to hang around for so long. So it's difficult to remove him. Someone's compared him to like a cancer, right? It's like getting rid of a cancer. Which is, maybe- is there anything we haven't spoken about that you think would be important or you'd want our listeners to, to know about or to understand before we finish? Well, just going back to the war effort, see, one interesting thing that was used was that the the Belarusian protesters were comparing the government to the Nazis. And they were used in the images of the partisans for their own campaign, which I thought this was a very effective way of turning state propaganda on its... But I'd like the listeners to be aware that 
that Belarus as well, per population, has more political prisoners than any place in Europe or, or any of the Western world for that matter. Thousands and thousands, I mean, thir over 30,000 people arrested after 2020. And that's an incredible number. And many of them, over a thousand political prisoners, and including some very prominent ones. And that this situation is continuing today. It's not something that stopped in 2021 and 2022. It's continuing today. People every day are arrested on the streets. They're beaten, sometimes for wearing a red tie, sometimes for an odd word that they mention Lukashenko or something in a conversation. Um, and they're more or less forgotten. And Belarusians are becoming a cause of, if you like, almost a secondary issue because of what's happening in Ukraine. But this is still continuing. And I think it's worth emphasizing that that's the case. Absolutely. Well, there's just one more thing that comes to mind, but I've, I realize how long I've kept you. But just very, very quickly, we saw, I think, fairly early, early on in the war, some partisan activity in Belarus and sort of, I think it was people sort of blowing up railway, bits of railway lines and so on to sort of sabotage the Russian war effort. Do you have much to add to that? Could you tell us a little bit about that at all? Yeah, I mean, the cyber group, uh, cyber partisans as they're known, which were formed in September 2020, I believe, have continued and they've actually they've actually infiltrated all the way into government organizations they've reproduced passports of lukashenko and the kgb leader and they're acting as almost permanent embarrassment to the government in what in what they've managed to uncover and they've also disrupted railroads trains taking goods to the to the russian army from belarusian territory and they officially now joined up with the kalinovsky regiment as well so they're they're not part of the government uh, shadow government but they are part of the opposition effort and they're still continuing and they're impossible to stop uh, the regime's not found any way to stop them yet and there's some of the most skilled it people you could imagine very very young you know i would think you could say the average age is well under 25 but they're people very skilled in it and belarus has long been one of the world leaders in it and um at one of the most advanced IT parks in in the world. This is one place where they've really gone ahead, despite the regime. So I think this, this disruption could continue for some time. And who knows what they would uncover next. But they've certainly hacked their way into the government. Well, David Marples, thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells, Charles Gear, and Gemma Brown, and today on Twitter, Rachel Duffy.